clearly have a set of recipients who are well credentialed and well have done so much. We very quickly want to move a panel of the recipients to hear some of what they would like to share. I've heard many of these people present and on panels before, and I know they have such incredible wisdom about their roles and about improving schools. We'll just get a small sample of it. And I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague from the Friday Institute, Marianne Wolf, who will facilitate the panel. Thank you. If you all want to join me up here, that would be great. One of the things that we know about learning is that students need to feel comfortable trying things, knowing that they might struggle, knowing that they might fail, and knowing that they can try again. And so an educator, Brad Curry, talks about how students take risk when teachers take risk, teachers take risk when leaders take risk. And part of the pleasure of getting to know each and every one of these superintendents up here is knowing that they have had to be bold They've had to try things. They've had to be willing to say, we're not quite sure how it's going to work, but we're going to do whatever it takes to meet the needs of every child in our district. And so it is an honor to be here with you all now tonight um, to share your story. So thank you so much. What I would love to do, and as Glenn said, we're not going to get to hear near as much as we want, but we are going to maximize every second with you all. I would love each of you to share a little bit about your journey and where your district is and how they're meeting the needs of each student. And Darren, I'm wondering if we could start with you. Sure. First of all, thank you so much to the Friday Institute for all you do to support public education. I've been in this building so many times with my team, and you just really have helped us to think about what we want the future to be with technology and education. But uh, a little bit about Davie County Schools, you see up there on the map, we're in the middle of the state with about 42,000 people in Davie County. We have 12 schools. Um, throughout the district, we're one of the first districts to have a fiber optic network. It connects all the schools. A number of years ago, uh, we put smart boards in every classroom when that technology was new. And over the years, we've just experimented with a variety of tools and resources. We're not a one-to-one -one school district. We have a variety of tools and digital resources we've implemented across the district. We're just very, very proud and, and glad that we've been able to provide a variety of tools and a lot of professional development. And you'll hear me talk about more professional development and the importance of that so that we can prepare students for the journey after graduation. Thank you, Darren. Tony? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to also thank uh, the Friday Institute for this honor. Vance County Schools is, is a, uh, an exciting place for, for me and a place where I have found uh, a ready and willing uh, group of individuals ready to take the leap uh, on behalf of students. Uh, we are, I say to them daily, uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, in a place um, that a lot of people, we give names to all kinds of places, so they called uh, my neighborhood the projects. We called it home. And so I say to them every day, if our children, if I can stand here today as the superintendent in Vance County, then there's nothing that our children can't do. And so we have embarked upon a journey of making sure that our children have opportunities, that they pursue excellence without excuse. Uh, that they not allow any barriers, artificial or real, uh, to get in the way. We tell them every single day, if you keep hitting the same wall, don't blame the wall. Uh, find a way around it. And so we want them to understand that we're there for them, and we want to give them every single opportunity to be uh, successful. So our journey has been about opening doors of opportunity, providing access uh, to those things that they wouldn't normally see, I tell them we are so very close to the Research Triangle Park, but we could be a million miles away. We use technology as a differentiator. We use technology as an accelerant. We use technology uh, as, a, as a shock absorber for those things that you don't have. We don't talk about what we don't have. We talk about what we don't have yet. <laughs> and so we want our kids to be uh, served well. And so we uh, nurture and cultivate uh, a, a climate and a culture in Vance County that says our kids are our primary uh, reason for doing the work and uh, that's our mission and so uh, you'll hear more about it but that's the work that we do. Thank you so much. Janet. Yes, thank you Mary Ann. I would also like to thank the Friday Institute not only for the award but um, throughout Rutherford County Schools journey the Friday Institute has been our very best partner in helping us plan and prepare for professional development. One of the things that we knew early on besides the fact that our um, 
infrastructure was inadequate is that our teachers were not prepared for where we wanted to go. And so we set up in a very intentional way to prepare to do those things. And so in Rutherford County, Jack mentioned, we use the um, acronym GLOBAL, Going Global, Growing Learning Opportunities Beyond All Limits. And we first had to help our teachers prepare for that. And that is truly about breaking down all barriers that our students might encounter that live in this rural area like all of the other folks up here tonight. Um, and our folks were losing jobs at a rapid rate, and we knew we needed to be a part of helping reinvent our community and doing that through reinventing our schools. Um, our students deserve access to the same educational opportunities. We talk about making sure that we match or exceed those that they could find anywhere. Their parents chose to live in Rutherford County. Their students need adequate schools. Um, and so we've been really pleased to um, work on that from the standpoint of equity of access to those different opportunities and tools. Excellent. Patrick? Good afternoon. I would also like to thank uh, the Friday <laughs> Institute for this honor and for the work that you've done to help us in Greene County uh, get better. We were part of uh, Jack's NCSSA's Digital Leadership Institute, as were lots of my colleagues, Cohort 1. And we're able to learn a lot of things from you all and a lot of things from, from our colleagues. And for that, I'm grateful. Uh, Green County's story started in 2003. 2003-2004 uh, school year, we implemented a one-to-one -one laptop program in grades 6 through 12. And that has sort of been the impetus for the rest of the work uh, that has happened. Uh, those devices, are, there's nothing magical about them, and our scores did not change right away. Um, it has required a lot of work, a lot of changes in mindset. And I think uh, a couple things that I'm proud of, when I became superintendent in 2008, the graduation rate in Greene County was 62%. Just this past year, it was 94.5%. And I think one of the things that the technology has allowed us to do is to personalize education for each child in Greene County Schools. And the, the path that a child may take uh, will look different or may look different than the one sitting beside him or her. So a couple things happened. Sam Houston's in the room. Uh, met Sam through the collaborative project starting in 2007. In 2011, he called me, said, I'm applying for a grant. Just trust me, I need your signature. Just trust me. <laughs> so I trusted Sam, and we were one of seven districts included in an investing in innovation grant that allowed us to put science kits in our classrooms in grades three through eight. About the same time, we were approached by North Carolina Virtual Public High School to uh, implement a blended STEM pilot program to develop four blended STEM courses. We use that opportunity to jump into developing our own courses and now have well into the 30s uh, the number of courses that we've developed. Those two programs, the I3 and the VPS uh, pilot, became the foundation for the STEM program that we have now in, in Greene County Schools that landed a Green Central High School being named uh, the first comprehensive traditional high school in the state. Um, STEM, I blanked out, what is it, Sam? STEM Model School of Distinction, <laughs> there we go. So that, I'm gonna stop there, but that, that's the foundation of our story. Thank you so much, Patrick. Lynn? Uh, like my colleagues, thank you. Thank you for all the help and support, and uh, I love Raleigh, this is home. Um, <laughs> Rowan County, I've been in Rowan County about four years. Prior to that, I was a superintendent in South Carolina for about eight years, so it was fun to come back home to North Carolina. Uh, we started our journey really surveying our community, talking to everyone about what it was they were proud of in Rowan County and what they wanted to change. And so we took that and worked on what we think is a really strong strategic plan to move us forward. Uh, to be able to keep one foot back in tradition and put one foot forward in where we were headed with our students. We do have about 65% poverty, and it's a real challenge in our district. We are one-to-one, -one, K through 12. Uh, when we rolled out our one-to-one uh, -one devices three years ago, we're in our second rollout now in our fourth year. Uh, we remember, and some of my colleagues are shaking their heads, remembering the day that we did that at the high school, we literally had students who opened those boxes and 
smell the computers because they had never owned anything new in their life. And this had changed their families, not just them. And uh, we allow our students to take their devices home in grades three through 12. Um, in that, uh, I think the, the thing I'm the most proud of in the last year has been we have five buses that go into impoverished communities to feed students in summer feeding. We take books and we feed all summer. And on that bus this summer, we had the pleasure of uh, serving kids. And in one home, as we watched kids come out of a trailer park, there were five kids in that home with cardboard on the windows. And um, there was a sign on the front of the house that's a proud moment for all of us because in our one-to-one -one devices, we carefully not only did PD, but we were careful about who we partnered with for software and gave our students awards for reading and literacy if they read uh, 40 articles and had passed the events. We put yard signs. Many of our kids don't have yards. Uh, but on that home was a sign that said, there's an extraordinary reader who lives here. And we took great pride in feeling like we had really changed the playing field for many of our children. Thank you, Lynn. Robert? Thank you. Uh, good, good evening to you all again. Thank you to the Friday Center for the award. It's uh, truly an honor. Uh, I certainly want to say uh, congratulations to my colleagues. It's, it's just uh, you know, uh, a great thing to share the stage with you. And, and we know we've all worked in this together. And I was just so glad to be here with you. Uh, Bladen County, uh, rural uh, southeastern North Carolina, uh, we are probably, I think, the fourth uh, largest county geographically in the state. Uh, we have 13 schools. Um, uh, the, the Cape Fear River divides the county down the middle. Uh, we have 12 schools on the, on the western side of the river and one school on the eastern side. So that lets you know uh, how challenging that can be in terms of trying to deliver education to children. Uh, uh, about 4,500 students, uh, pre-K through 12. Uh, so it's uh, very rural area is what I'll tell you. Uh, we are about 80% free and reduced lunch. Uh, the journey for Bladen County in terms of uh, digital teaching and learning did start in, in 2010 before I arrived uh, as superintendent. Uh, we had received the Golden Leaf Grant and with that grant, uh, they were gonna buy a number of iPods, little small iPods that would be introduced into the, uh, into the school. Uh, well, after becoming superintendent, uh, we worked with Golden Leaf to change the nature of that grant, uh, and that is where we got the impetus for the one-to-one -one, uh, program. Uh, I'll say the journey really started with uh, leadership and vision. Uh, upon arriving in the district, the one thing that we wanted to do was to create a model of how you deliver a 21st century education in a rural setting, uh, and I think that's where the vision started. Uh, beyond that vision, also, it, it dealt with the leadership team. And I do have my leadership team in the back. And you guys could just stand for a minute. Uh, hmm. uh, because I, I, I said to them, all my central office folks, stand up. Uh, <laughs> but, the, but the biggest part was, was really partnering with the Friday Institute and understanding the things that we needed to do in order to make digital teaching and learning a success in the district. And, and that dealt with being able to provide quality PD before we rolled any kind of a device out to students. Uh, after that, we were, as most districts were, taking advantage of the race to the top funding to be able to create an infrastructure uh, within those schools that could uh, handle the, uh, uh, the digital devices that were going to be on the network. Uh, so it really began there, and things began to, to, to roll after that. Uh, the greatest thing that we've been able to do is to get teachers to understand the nature uh, of digital teaching and learning is not about the device, uh, but how children have an opportunity uh, to interact, uh, to be able to be in control of their own learning, and they have the opportunity as teachers to be facilitators. Uh, through all of that, uh, online learning has become an integral part of what we do. We have the opportunity to be a part of the new schools grant, and with that, uh, students at the high school have the opportunity uh, to have access to college curriculum. Well, after that grant ended, we were able to continue that effort. Uh, and this past year, we had 19 students that were able to graduate with an associate's degree uh, along with their high school degree. Now, we're supposed to say simultaneously, but they actually graduated a week before, so <laughs> I'll tell you one that. Uh, so it's really about 
uh, making sure that everyone in the community understands the need uh, of a school district as it relates to technology. So what started out as a grant uh, for one-to-one -one technology and other technology initiatives in the district is now understood as a must-have. Uh, the one thing that I've always tried to stress as an educator is that technology is different from brick and mortar in that we can spend $20 million on a new school building and that will last for 30, 40, and in Bladen County, 80 or 90 years. Uh, but when it comes to technology infrastructure, you can invest six or seven million dollars and then you'll need to do that again in a very short amount of time. So we've tried to work with the commissioners to get them to understand the need so that now when we talk about uh, refreshing devices, it's a part of a budget effort. Uh, so we've tried to really change the landscape in terms of outside thinking of the community or, um, or your constituents thinking about how they need to support uh, technology uh, in the schools, but the biggest part I, I still do believe is leadership uh, from the district staff that are there, the principals in the school, and how they get teachers to understand how they have to change what it is they do as instructors. Thank you. And Jeff? Thank you. It's great to be here, and these are the folks that I steal ideas from all the time. <laughs> um, I grew up in Transylvania County, and I grew up uh, in the southern part of the county near the South Carolina line. Uh, the furnace worked about half the time. Uh, by the way, you'll hear me slip a little bit into Cedar Mountain language. Uh, my wife's a licensed <laughs> translator. Uh, you can't understand me. But um, Transylvania County is uh, unique. We've had a lot of high expectations for a very long time. Um, 20 years ago, the county had about 28,000 people. We have an elevation difference in our county near, from the, near the South Carolina-Georgia line of about 1,000 feet all the way up to near the Haywood County line of 6,000 feet. Uh, it's very difficult to get signals. When I used to go out and check roads and weather, I used to carry a radio, a cell phone, and sometimes I'd have to stop at a house. Uh, so we know that there's some technological uh, challenges there, but the reality is we have a very different type of population than we once had. 20 years ago, we were just at the end of an era where when I went to high school in the 70s, we had 4,500 manufacturing jobs. We had the highest blue collar wages in the state of North Carolina with three large plants. They're gone. They all left. Our population now is about 33,000. Uh, Brevard High School, uh, when I went there, when I attended school, had close to 1,200 students. We're about 750 now. It's changed the dynamics of our county. As a career technical education director, I guess our journey in our county started when I started as the director of CTE back in 98. Uh, we, we tried to do a lot of different things to enhance our programs and technology was one of the keys. Working with different boards and being with different committees in our community, I realized that we've got to change what we do in order for our students to have the fruits that their parents and their grandparents had. Uh, that's what they tell us, you know, I want my child to go out and make the wages that I made. Well, you can't go work in a plant anymore. You've got to be ready for a new world. And so we started that journey then, and then when I became superintendent, we looked at ways that we could carve out um, a niche for Transylvania County students to be ready for the new economy. We did a lot of research. I do a lot of reading about what's out there in the world, what's coming. It's like standing on a beach and you see a tidal wave coming. You can stand there and hold up your hands or you can try to get on something to write it. And we needed a spark, and the spark for us was a Golden Leaf grant, quite frankly, and that helped us to start going one-to-one. -one. That, that was a valuable spark. Without that, I don't know that we would be where we are now. And so we went with Chromebooks. We went with Google. And what we started to do with our students was to try to work with them to understand that it's not just a device, that this is a key for a lot of different things, but the, but the biggest part of that key and you've heard it up here, is we had to have staff that understood how to do blended learning. I do not believe that you will ever replace a great teacher in a classroom. The art and craft of teaching is something just miraculous. But you can arm them with the types of tools and technology to enhance that to go to the next level. And what we find every day is that each day we find that, you know, the more you know, we realize the more we don't know. But it's a very exciting journey that we've started on. And, and what we're seeing now with a lot of service jobs in our community and a different economy is that some of our students are starting to understand that they can 
they can make a living. They can be very successful. They can go anywhere they want to. If they live in a part of the county where they can't get Internet coverage, it doesn't matter. They have a device. And we encourage our parents to get on them, too. If they want to, I'm not going to worry about that because they, they, need to, they need to be able to understand that there's a vast world out there and technology can open those doors. It doesn't matter where you live in that county. We're viewed as being wealthy because we have a lot of retirees. Uh, the average median age in Transylvania County, we, we're, we're second oldest in the state. Uh, the average age is close to comatose with some of our communities. <laughs> but you know, they're great. And they have started supporting us, and we appreciate that. And we're trying to tap into what they see out from their experience working in the, in, you know, the, the Midwest or in New York or other places, and they bring that back. And so that's where our journey is. Uh, it's exciting. We've got a lot more to do, and uh, we're excited about where it can go. Well, Jeff, I wonder if you can talk. Um, I know this is all too brief, so I just am going to apologize at the beginning. Um, but I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about what teaching and learning looks like in your classrooms, um, or not in your classrooms. Well, teaching and learning uh, is, is changing a great deal from the standpoint that you can't just get up and lecture to students. So we've known that for a very long time. When you go to blended learning, what it does, it puts us as educators out of our comfort zone. <laughs> because it's one thing to be able to, to go with, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say who it was, but I had a teacher that, that worked for me years ago, and, and she was fantastic. In fact, she still had some great lesson plans from when I was in high school. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> It puts them out of their comfort zone to be able to use a technological device and to use it well. If you have it in there and they're just opening it up and they're Googling something, that's not effective. We want to make sure they understand how to use the device in teaching. And that's made us better teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all, all of us, in, all of us are teachers here. That has made us better teachers, and it's made us realize where things are going well, where they're not going well, and it's also helped us to identify the other types of technology and apps that are out there that we can use in our class to, to enhance that teaching and learning. You know, and, and we listen to students. When I first started the virtual day thing, I had a, a, one of my favorite students. He, he was a star athlete for one of my high schools, and he's just such a smart kid. I, I love him to death, and he's successful now. He, he was sitting in my superintendent's advisory committee meeting, and, and I was trying to explain to them, we're going to go to virtual days, and this is what it's going to look like. You have so much work to do. We're going to have your high school teachers be online in, in case you lose power. We, we were trying to work out all the details, and each time it happens, we try to revisit it and do it a little better the next time. Uh, hopefully, we won't have any snow this year, but we're going to have some, <laughs> I'm sure. And, and he stopped me, interrupted me. You have to know him. He, he, he processes things differently. He said, wait, he said, Dr. Medeiros, can, no offense, can, can you stop a minute? I, let, let me get this straight just a minute. You're telling me that on a day we have snow, if, I, if I'm willing to sit in there for three or four hours and my pajamas next to the fire and, and I'm online <laughs> and, and you're going to count that as a day and I'm not going to have to go make it up at the end of the year on a Saturday? And I said, that's right. He said, I'm there. <laughs> He said, and I'll make sure everybody else is there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. And Robert, you talked a lot about the changes and what it's already led to for your students. I wonder if you want to mention just a little more about what teaching and learning looks like in your district, and then we have some other questions for our other Absolutely. wonderful and, awardees. And I know Mary Ann is nervous about the time, so <laughs> I, I won't uh, take a long time. But just as Jeff has said, uh, this is what you'll see in the classroom, uh, students that are collaborating, uh, teachers that are being facilitators of, uh, of learning. Uh, the biggest transition that we've had to make is for teachers to give up uh, the power and authority that they believe that they have as teachers. Uh, I was a, a, an old history teacher, social studies teacher, so you know we love to tell stories and we like to be the sage on the stage. They've recognized that that has had, that has had to change. Uh, so students have the opportunity not only to collaborate but to create. That's what you see in the classroom. Uh, I think one of the things we're most proud of uh, is the opportunity to participate in the, in the Math One pilot with the uh, uh, North Carolina Virtual Public School. Uh, and this was a co-teaching model where we had a teacher at the school and a teacher with the Virtual Public School and they taught these students simultaneously. Uh, these students were selected based on EVOS data and they were predicted to not be proficient. Uh, at the end of this pilot, uh, nearly all of the students saw growth and 
roughly 50% of those students were proficient. Uh, so we now understand that when students have the opportunity to collaborate with each other, to collaborate with other teachers, we see the impact uh, that technology used in the right way can have on learning. And we had an opportunity to be able to present uh, that student uh, at the 10-year uh, celebration of the North Carolina Virtual Public Schools. So that's what you'll see, the, the exact same thing in any innovative 21st century class is about collaboration. And it was so funny that uh, I asked my assistant superintendent, I said, uh, give me your thoughts on this particular question. And we put down almost the exact same things in terms <laughs> of collaboration, creation, uh, students being able to work together. I love it. Thank you so much. Now, Darren, when you think of all the things you've been able to do, I think it's helpful to hear about what you see as the biggest factor or essential condition that allowed you to make the progress you've made. I think probably the biggest factor in my community was um, a change in conversation and a cultural shift. Um, in Davie County, I've been there seven years, I arrived and there was a significant divide in the community on the future of education, the future of academic services, the future of facilities. And through some very careful strategic planning and some intentional relationships that we built, some assessments that we did together as a community, conversations we had with people who had very different opinions, we bridged that divide. And as a community, we were able to come together and pass the largest bond referendum in the history of the county. We opened up um, a new high school this fall that we feel like is a model high school for the state and equipped it with some new technologies. We'd encourage folks to come out and visit that because the, the planning for that school was a, really a three-year process. And our teachers were very, very involved in what goes here, what goes here, and what goes in my classroom? What will I be using to provide instruction? But that conversation and cultural shift, I think, was the biggest piece uh, that made some things possible. It, it, it led to us having a second highest return on investment and for education excellence in the state. Uh, it led to another Golden Leaf Grant, led to a big partnership we just kicked off with a public-private partnership with the Mebbin Foundation to support pre-K-3 literacy. So a lot of those things were put together because you think about this, we talk about engagement of students all the time. If we don't engage students with quality instruction, they will be engaged with something in the classroom. <laughs> the community works the same way. If we don't inform our communities and share with them the successes and the challenges we have in public education, they can either be engaged with us or they'll be engaged with something else. So that's the lesson we've learned in Davie. Thank you. And Tony, what have you seen as the most important enablers or essential conditions? I think the, the change in conversation. Um, I believe that uh, when I arrived, we uh, one of the things that I really tried very hard to give our staff was permission to fail. And I say that to them often. It's okay to fail as long as we're failing forward. Uh, make the mistakes, own the mistakes, but learn from the mistakes. Uh, and I saw immediately that people were willing then to embrace change as a very real uh, uh, experience for our community. Uh, we had to have some very hard conversations about expectations. We had to have hard conversations about collaboration, not just with kids in classrooms, but collaboration amongst all of those stakeholders in our community uh, who really would say on the one hand that education is important. And so we had to then say, then we have to believe this. We have to show this overtly to our children uh, and behave that way. And so I believe that part of it was really uh, uh, developing with our school board a very clear strategic uh, direction for the community, working with our, our, our county commissioners to understand, help them understand the direction, meeting with all of those stakeholder groups and getting everyone to see that that change was possible uh, and most importantly that change was necessary. Uh, but most importantly, embracing, uh, having, uh, watching folk embrace a mindset that said we can. Uh, that's been uh, extremely exciting for me to see uh, individuals and not worrying so much about if we fail, then the, the first question uh, for us should be, what did we learn from that failure? Mm -hmm. And not, oh my goodness, we failed. Uh, because I think that was the one thing that I saw. There was this huge fear of, if we fail, something's wrong. We had had a, we had tried a one-to-one -one in our community. It didn't go as well as we wanted it to go. 
And so the first thing we did, we did a, re, uh, a restart. We said, stop. When in a hole, the first thing you do, stop digging. Just stop. <laughs> now, let's talk about how we get out of this situation and how we take the lessons from the hole back to the ground, to, 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 the, to the level, and use them uh, to move forward. And so I've been, I've been pleased. We're training our teachers. We're giving them uh, the support that they need so that they will be stronger in a blended learning environment as we move forward. Thank you. And Patrick, I wonder, kind of switching gears a little bit, if you can talk about some of the primary challenges. Because um, I know once we, one of the things we know is if one of you has that challenge, we know you're not alone, right? And so can you share a little bit about some of those? Sure. Uh, the first uh, barrier or challenge, and I think everybody will agree, is resources uh, of the financial kind, money. Uh, and there's, when I say that, I mean in three, three or four different areas. Number one, you've got to have money uh, to purchase devices and not just once you have the money to purchase a device you're not done you've got to and this is lessons learned the hard way you've got to have a significant amount set aside for repair replacement those types of costs next and you've heard the importance all I think every single person uh, in this lineup has mentioned the importance of professional development and I can't, that can't be un, uh, understated enough. We have got to be able to train our teachers constantly. I think you heard it was Rob, I think, talking about the investment. You can put 20 million in a building that'll last 80, 90 years. You can put seven or eight million dollars in infrastructure and it's out of date uh, in five years and you've got to start all over. So that, that's a huge piece uh, of the puzzle uh, as well. Then you're going to have some personnel uh, requirements. you got to have people who can run your networks uh, who might not necessarily know anything about education but they've got to know things about how to get bandwidth and how to get things that I don't even know. We've like <laughs> Phil Emer sitting back there in the back. He's, he's my go-to man when, when something goes wrong uh, but you, you've got to have you've got to have that piece as well and then don't forget content. You content Textbook companies are savvy. They're not just going to go out of business because we don't use textbooks anymore. They're changing rapidly and have figured out how to make content extremely expensive, uh, uh, just as expensive as textbooks books were. So, yes, a primary challenge is money, but it's, it's not just money. It's in the areas I was... I, I described. Janet, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit, because many of you mentioned how important stakeholders are, and what are some of the steps that you took to really build that stakeholder engagement, but also buy-in for the important work you've been doing? A big piece of the buy-in initially was easy. I hate to admit that it was easy. I, I know you want to hear how hard we worked on this, but if you're in a community of 60,000 that lost about three or 4,000 jobs in a five or six year period, you know, these parents understood comp global competition, and they also understood that w their children would be competing not only for jobs with kids down the road in Mooresville, where they had a one-to-one, -one, and expansive digital learning tools and resources, but also other folks around the world. And so that was not a hard sell initially. Always, though, what comes back is we believe it needs to happen, but no one wants to come up with the funding for it, and it is not cheap, and it is ongoing. It's not a one-time purchase. And as it evolves, you have to update and change and move forward. So we believe that the way we got the buy-in, that was pretty easy. The sustainability of that buy-in and the commitment to it as a community, I think, is demonstrated in the results. We were in 10, 000, uh, 2010, uh, graduation rate of about 64.1%. We finished last year with the best ever recorded graduation rate in Rutherford County, and that was 85% since 2010 to 2017. Our dropout rate is the lowest it's ever been, and that's one of the metrics that Rutherford County, um, even though we were on par with the state in many things, we've never been there. We've always been worse than whatever the state average was in both of those metrics, but we're working to improve that. The other thing that I think is key and I think is really um, maybe um, hitting a good um, point with our community right now is this. All of our schools qualify for free and reduced lunch at a rate of above 50%. So by definition in the state's accountability system, every single one of our 18 schools is a high poverty school. 
when the school performance grades came out, of course we looked to see how we compare statewide. But one of the things we wanted to do was see, compare apples to apples. The model is very predictive of poverty. Most of the schools that get A's are not high poverty schools. Most of the schools, in fact, about 97% of the schools who earned F's and D's are high poverty schools. So the model would predict that our schools would earn more D's and F's than A's and B's. And I'm proud to tell you, and what our community is very proud of, is that the highest performing school in Rutherford County Schools is one of our schools. Um, not a charter, I'll just throw that in there. Not a charter, a traditional public school. And then we have more B's than we had anything else. And we had C's and we have one D, which we're really working on. But the model would have pre predicted something else. When we look at that growth curve, we're outperforming what the predictive nature is of poverty in school performance grades. And our community believes that along with some other initiatives, that the access to digital technology in an equitable manner is, is a key to that. Thank you. And it's very clear why um, each of you were chosen. And Lynn's question actually has to do with leadership. And I think as we look across, it is clear that your leadership and the leadership of those that you empowered made a huge difference. And Lynn, I wonder if you could share a few strategies that you think really made a difference when you went into your district, but also what you've been able to accomplish in the past four years. Um, I, I think the most important part about leadership in our district has been a real shared leadership. Uh, we've done a lot of work around being sure that everybody leads at every level. Uh, we were really proud we had uh, Manning Scott, thanks to, to Jack who introduced us to him, to talk to our custodians and our cafeteria workers about teaching and learning in our organization and what's your role in teaching and learning, not just in sweeping floors and serving lunches. Um, so it's leading at every level. My son's here and he probably would laugh when I said I was leading a digital transformation. You don't even know how to turn the TV on, Mom. And um, so he thinks that's a real joke. Um, so you have to depend on other people to help. And uh, um, some of those partners are not necessarily the partners that you think of. We've spent a lot of time in book studies and visiting and going to see. We call ourselves the Go and See District. We go <laughs> see everything, including Anne Goodnight was gracious to let our high school principals inside a SAS for mm. a, a day, a full day, to talk about leadership, not about software. Uh, but how do you shift a culture of leadership and how they've been able to do that within their organization. Um, our school board travels to um, Millican and other companies that have been ethical and moral companies that, that are pushing the edge about innovation. So we think a lot about innovation at every level so everyone leads where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, then it becomes, as all of these people know, it's not about the tool. It's really about innovative thinking. Absolutely. And um, what we're going to ask each of you now is to kind of give your, your quick word of advice. What do you advise all of us here, the leaders in our state? Many of them look to you as they should, um, and especially today with the medals. What is your advice? And I wonder, Jeff, if we could start with you. Model what you're asking your people to do. Uh, I wanted our our schools to be well prepared and, and we're still working on it on how to use blended learning and we use as I mentioned earlier we use Google Classroom and so uh, I I went out and became uh, level one educator certified because I'm not going to ask my administrators to to lead something that, that they don't understand and and we're asking our other our other teachers to do so we now and last year it was, I asked them to please try to become certified, and most of them did. <laughs> this year I told them by the end of the year review they will be certified. <laughs> uh, but but they're, they're excited about it. I, I, I say that uh, just in humor, but I think you have to model what you're preaching. Great advice. Robert. The advice I would give uh, is to focus on leadership. Um, if you have the proper leadership and the, and the proper leadership team, uh, then they have the understanding of how you communicate what's necessary for a community, particularly uh, rural North Carolina. Uh, after that, you have to have people to think about equity and, and how public schools are still able to provide that and how technology is, is an integral part of that in the 21st century. And finally, uh, to have them to think about exponential change. Uh, the one thing that we recognize is that 
uh, things are going to change so fast for students. And the only thing that we can do is to teach them what to do when they don't know what to do. Because that will be uh, the cornerstone of their lives for the next 40 or 50 years as we go through the 21st century. And then after that, it really is about having a plan in terms of how you roll something out, professional development, having a plan before devices ever get into a kid's hand. But it's really about leadership, having your community to think about equity, and having them to realize that we're facing exponential change. Love it. Lynn. Just be courageous. Uh, we think about uh, enjoying being uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not <laughs> learning. And that's for everybody in the organization. <laughs> Great advice. Patrick? Uh, you need, educators need to understand that we don't need to try to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. We can learn from each other just like we've all learn from each other sitting up here. So if you're getting ready to undertake an initiative, don't feel like you've got to be on your own. Reach out. We're more than happy to share uh, the things that have gone well and the things that have not gone so well so that hopefully uh, you can avoid those. The other that I would suggest, we talked a lot about professional development for teachers, but leaders need to be developed as well. And take advantage of the things that are out there. Shirley Prince from NC Papa is here. There's digital learning programs for principals and assistant principals in her organization. Take advantage of those. Jack has the Digital uh, Learning Leadership Institute. Take advantage of that, and that's working here with the Friday Institute. So uh, th those would be my two takeaways. Excellent. I'm Janet. Going, I'm going to echo what Patrick said. That's what I've thought about all day is the most important advice to share is that um, many times it feels like a competition among schools. You just heard me say proudly we were happy about how we compared. But I think if we want to move our state forward, we, we need to move beyond that to a point where we, we develop something great. We want to share it, not so that someone recognizes it and praises us, but so that if there's a tidbit that someone else can take away, we need to be willing to open the doors and invite others in to see what we're doing well. And then while they're there, most of the time what I have found happens is they sometimes point out something they're doing that even without us asking for it, we find a solution through that collaboration. And so I think that's the, the way that we'll solve this moving forward as a state. Excellent. Tony. I would say first, tell the truth. Um, I, I sit often and I hear people say, talk about we're preparing for the 21st century. The last time I checked the calendar, we're 17 years in. <laughs> I think we've got to embrace the truth. And the truth is that it's moving a lot faster than we will ever be able to embrace. And I think we have to acknowledge that, that we can't keep up and that we can be learners and that we're all going to have to learn and, and do some things differently. The second thing I would say is to um, understand, and I, I, I'm going to use Lynn's phrase, that we have to be courageous in this work. I think we have to be willing to have a big, bold vision about what this work should look like, what it can be, and be willing to stand up and understand that a big, bold vision will bring big, bold opposition. And that a smaller vision will bring smaller opposition and no vision will bring none. But I think in this work as leaders, if we're courageous enough to recognize this is bold work because there are people who really want to give kids a slate and chalk and say, go over in the corner and, and practice your multiplication tables. And I think as leaders, we have to have enough courage to step forward and be willing to say, this is bold work for us right now, and our kids deserve it. And particularly in the rural context, our kids have to be able to compete. I could always beat my brother in basketball in the neighborhood, but I couldn't make the team at school. So I, how competitive was I really? And so we've got to give them the understanding that the world is a lot bigger than our small communities. And we have to be able to show them. Technology gives us that tool. It, te it tears down every wall that anybody could put up for them. And so I would say be willing to embrace that, be willing to share that, tell the truth, and be courageous. Thank you. So I'll go last. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I think when we, I reflect on leadership and lessons, I think about a time that I spent on a panel with Governor Hunt in Asheville at a lieutenant governor's conference. And I saw how the governor was very direct and had crucial conversations with lieutenant governors across America, teaching them how to be a great governor. And that model is something we should replicate as superintendents 
and teaching our principals how to be great leaders in our schools. And when they are great leaders in our schools, we can use technology to help teachers become excellent. And my biggest piece of advice, I guess, would be we should never just go out and invest in the new greatest technology. We must continue to invest in our public school's biggest asset, and that's our teachers. Excellent. Well, I know it is very clear to each and every one of you why the Friday Medalists are these seven, and it is a great honor to be with you. Thank you for sharing your experience, your advice, and also just your lessons learned to all of us. Congratulations. certainly are delighted to have you. You're all such creative, courageous, collaborative leaders of digital age, I agree. We can't keep saying 21st century. We say digital age, ever-changing, rapidly changing global digital world in which we live. And thank you, Marianne, for facilitating. I'll just add one comment. We are about to wrap up. We have one just to give out the awards. But I do have to say, I really appreciate, as the executive director here, your comments about the value of the Friday Institute. But I hope you realize that we all learn more from you than you learn from us. And that's, we're just sort of bumblebees <coughs> taking things from one of you and telling the others about it. And it's just this great collaborative uh, work where we learn all of this together. It's time to give the awards. Um, I'd like to ask a, another great education leader and friend of, of all of us in the Friday Institute, Ann Goodnight, to come join us to hand out the awards. Jack, would you join us? Craig, would you join us? We're going to do this graduation style. But we'll do it very, very quickly, because we know um, we're ready for the, um, for the uh, reception. And you'll get a quick uh, photograph of each one as we go. So it's that usual graduation hand stick line. And first up for the official award of the Friday Medal for 2017, Dr. Darren Hartness. Next up, we have Dr. Anthony Jackson. Next, we have Dr. Jeff McDarris. Patrick Miller. I should have said Dr. Patrick Miller for everybody. And Dr. Lynn Moody. Add one note. Uh, Marianne and I visited Lynn's district the end of last school year, and I always remember talking to two young women who were high school seniors, and they were so articulate telling us when they were freshmen they really disliked coming to school each day. They found it boring, unengaging, and by the time they were seniors they talked about the total cultural change in the school and how thrilled they were to come to school every day how much they look forward to it, and how they are hoping that college would be as interesting as their high school. <laughs> so those are the kind of stories that make this very, very real. And Dr. Robert Taylor. <laughs> We've got the music going. And last, Janet's having a good week. Uh, Dr. Janet Mason, I don't know what she's doing tomorrow, but yesterday she was named North Carolina Superintendent of the Year, and today we're delighted to award you Friday night Thank you so much. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. Well, thank you all. It's been a delight. We have a wonderful reception. Please join us. Talk to our recipients. Wait. I'm forgetting something. What am I forgetting? Um, you haven't forgotten it, but I don't no. want anyone else to forget it. This is a very special occasion, and we've acknowledged wonderful people, incredible educators, and the work at the Friday Institute. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Glenn Kleiman, who has been a key part of this for a long, long time and has made what many might have thought the impossible possible. And next year, at this time, Dr. Kleiman will not be standing here giving out the awards because he will uh, be moving into perhaps um, a role that gives him an opportunity to do more of the think than to do as he uh, transitions uh, from the role of executive director to a faculty member. So I would just like to give my heart, well, thank you to Glenn and all that he has done. Thank you, Marianne. We're going to just hold the recipients for one quick picture, but please join us in the reception out in the lobby. Thank you all very much.